right. <clears throat> All right. Well, you're there in Genesis. We're going to end up in Romans. And again, it's another commercial from our theme. I want you to know, most of you guys don't know this, but this says, you know, Solid Rock Baptist Tabernacle, one another. That's our theme, one another. And our verse, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 12. That was our first message this year. But I love church um, inside of each one of these pictures. I love church is all of my messages for the year. They're all there. Um, Strive together one with another. Greet ye one another. Pray for one another. Forbearing one another. Accuse one another. I'm just kidding. That's not there. But uh, all of my messages are there. I'm telling you that because it's not that I'm not prepared. It seems like every two or three weeks, I'm like putting our theme to the side to preach something else. This isn't my church. It's the Lord's church. And on Friday, I don't remember where I was now. It was late on Friday. The Lord said, wait another week for one of our messages, which is ready. Uh, It's been ready a couple weeks ago. Um, but on Friday, the Lord just led me to, to another passage. And it is a message. I was thankful. I was telling Brother Reggie, it isn't me reinventing the will. Like I have to write a new outline for it. It's something I had preached back about six years ago. Um, and I just thought, okay. And, and so I redid it a little bit because I, I kind of know why the Lord put this on my heart. The last few days in the news, these are, and I'm not, what, I'm not going to make any apologies. It's the Lord's message. The last few days in the news, I've seen things like this, and I'm quoting from the National Review. It has been a banner week for the attempt by progressives to re-engineer basic biological realities before our eyes. The same week that a man presenting himself as a woman named Leah Thomas outcompetes the nation's best female athletes at the NCAA Division I Swimming Championships, USA Today has named Rachel Levine another man now presenting himself as female as one of its, quote, women of the year. That bothered me a lot a bit, but not enough to really make me feel like I need to bring it up in church. We see it. It's around us. We're in California. It might have been here first. Um, And it didn't affect me too much Monday and Tuesday, I guess, Because of my sin nature, it's not really affecting me like it should. I'm I'm getting used to it. I'm getting used to going to Knott's Berry Farm with my children because we have season passes there, not for the fun, but for the food. It's a financial come up for us. And so we go there, we eat, we leave. And we didn't even know they had rides for like three years. Just kidding. But the kids, every time we go, Sadie, who sat over here before she was dismissed, are we riding rides today? No, we're not riding rides. Oh, just pizza. <laughs> yep, that's it. We're going to eat and we're leaving. And um, I've seen so much there. Last time I was there, saw two teenage girls uh, doing things that married couples, men and women, should do. And I'm seeing that all the time. Again, being in California... They call us the land of fruits and nuts for a reason. And I'm not allowing my eye to affect my heart like it used to. But what bothered me more than those stories of now someone there in D.C. infiltrating. I'm trying to use my words wisely and be careful here, but. Two men, I can't call them men, two males, they were created as males, are presenting themselves as females. And even someone as something, some entity as strong as NCAA, allowing it to happen, um, honestly didn't really bother me as much as it should have. Then we got over into the Supreme Court issues. 
The Supreme Court really has, I tried to put it in a bottle, five jobs, if you will, five functions, in my opinion. One, the Supreme Court can take decisions between government and citizens. That's a big deal. The Supreme Court can reopen old cases. That's a big deal. The Supreme Court is the guardian of the Constitution. When I was studying on that, I thought, wow, the guardian of the Constitution. The Supreme Court can approach, uh, people can approach to the Supreme Court for their rights and law. So you can appeal and go through a process as a citizen of the United States of America. The Supreme Court can give punishment to persons or people who will not follow the Constitution. So the Supreme Court's kind of a big deal. Just the word supreme makes you think. When I think of a pizza, and I think of a pepperoni or a meat lover's pizza or a different thing, but you call it a supreme, it better have every, I better not even see the cheese <laughs> because I want everything on there, supreme. But when Marsha Blackburn, I believe, I don't have this in my notes, I think she's, I know she's a Republican, but I think she's in the state of Tennessee. Regardless, Marsha Blackburn asked um, Ms. Jackson, Katanji Brown Jackson, to define the word woman. This was one of her answers. First, if you saw the video, her face was as if, as if you asked me to speak in Chinese. I uh, wouldn't even know where to begin. In fact, I wouldn't begin because I can't. So when she was asked, and again, this woman, this female, is being looked at, and we already know will be confirmed to be one of our Supreme Court judges. We know it. She was asked a simple question. What is a woman? Now, if you go back just a few weeks, our president, alleged president, Joe Biden, said that he would appoint, or at least recommend, an African-American female, woman. And so this African-American woman was asked, what is a woman? And she can't even define it. So are we even fulfilling his desire for a woman to be, if she doesn't even know what a woman is? So this is her, one of her answers. She said, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a biologist. I remember when Chanel was born. She's now teaching junior church. That's amazing. And I remember the very first time we heard her scream. And she screamed. So we knew she's alive. So far, so good. But I remember being, as a new father, overwhelmed with all of it. I remember the hospital bed there. We were, what city were we in? Del Amo? I always want to say Del Amo. It wasn't Del Amo. Los Alamitos. I always have to think of the racetrack, and I think of my dad, and I don't want to chase that rabbit. But anyway, think about the racetrack there in Los Alamitos. And I remember standing here, my wife being on the bed. My mother-in-law was here. We had one of the meanest nurses in all of the world, and I have it on tape over here. And I remember here, there was a picture of a barn and just a beautiful scene of like a ranch. And I remember looking at my wife, looking at that and thinking, don't pass out. I remember talking to the Lord, please don't let her die because I thought she's going to die. This is, what have we done? What in the world were we thinking? We could have just adopted. We never learned. We had 11 more, but... Uh, so we're sitting here. I'm looking at the picture. She's, I don't even know what she's doing. My mother-in-law, I don't know what she's thinking, but what I saw was, you did this to my baby. And I'm over here. She's there. I'm looking at this picture. And eventually, the baby came, screaming, Wah! top of her lungs. At the time, top of its lungs. Because I didn't know. We didn't check. We didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. Chanel was born. We had names picked out, but we didn't know if it was a boy or a girl yet. And so one of the things I remember my wife saying was, is it a boy or a girl? 
And I remember, you know, the nurse or the doctor going, you know, it's a healthy baby girl. How did they know that? Now, I, I'm being a little bit facetious, but, but not really. The, the question is, they looked, and they were able to determine immediately that the baby was a girl, a female. We did not have to take a poll. We did not have to call in a biologist. We did not need experts. How do we even know that the only way we can determine if a child is a boy or a girl and not something else? How do, how do we even know if there's only two genders? Every question you have in life can be answered with the Word of God. Every single one. The Bible says in Peter, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. There is nothing in your life that can be answered or can't be answered without... Oh, let me say that again. I totally butchered that. There's nothing in your life that cannot be answered within the pages of the Word of God. doesn't matter what you are personally going through. Teenagers, please let that sink in. You're going to have moments in your life where you are going to struggle and you're going to doubt and you're going to be confused. There's going to be moments in your life where you're going to be distracted and you're going to wonder, is it even worth it? Am I this? Is this that? Run to the book. But don't run to the book first. Ooh. Where should we run first? Run to God. You won't even understand this unless he opens your eyes. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then he reminds you, I gave you a book about that. I was reading to this morning my proverb of the day, and I'm reading. Man, there's some great verses in there that I needed today. I was continuing my study in 1 Corinthians. I needed that today. How do we know how many genders there are? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says this. So God created man. That would be mankind, humans. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. Created he them. Notice your Bible in verse or chapter 2, verse 18. Here's a little more description to chapter 1, verse 27. Chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, and I've said this before, but I can't help but to say it again. Go back to chapter 1, verse 30. Verse 31, and God saw, I need your help. Chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was, what are those next two words? And behold, it was very good. I've said this before, but it's okay to say it again. It's the word of God. When he was done creating everything, it was very good. But in chapter 2, he gives us a little more insight, uh, really about verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. That's the summary. He created male and female, and it was very good. But in the midst of creating, we see in chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not, what is that next word? Chapter 2, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not what? Good. Now his conclusion was, it's very good. And then he rested on day 7. But in chapter 2, he gives us a little more insight of this very good process. And so after creating Adam out of dirt, the dust of the ground, verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. Adam being alone, man, this isn't good. I've created all of this. And I'm looking at Adam. This isn't good. It's not good for man. It is not good that man should be alone. This is what I'll do. I'll make him and help. Long pause. Because that is not one word. 
meat for him. I will make him an help that is suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. So God already said, you know what? Adam being alone, that's not good. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to show him his need. So all the animals are coming to Adam and he's saying, you are tall, wow, giraffe. And he begins to name the animals, cockroach, and he couldn't get it. But anyway, and the Lord God said, it is not good that men should be alone. So I will make for him a help me. He already determined I'm going to give him someone that is suitable for him. But then God gives a little commercial to that process. Before he did it, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Now, this had already happened, but he's just given us some more insight to chapter 1. And every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam... There was not found and help meet for him, suitable for him. So Adam is saying, oh, male giraffe, female giraffe, carry on. Male dog, female dog, carry on. And he's going through. They're all by twos. They're all, they've all got a partner. And as he's going through this, in verse 28, Adam gave all the names, but the, oh, excuse me, verse 20, but at the end of verse 20, but for Adam, there was not found in help. He was alone. He had no help. So verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. I say this all the time. I can't help but to say it again. You want to find a wife? Go to sleep. Rest in the Lord. Let God provide. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep. Don't be sleeping with your eye open. I'll be in balance. He that findeth the wife findeth a good thing. But man, rest in the Lord in his timing. Adam was working, doing the will of God. He's naming the animals. He's tending to the garden. He's doing all that God designed him to do. And then God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. A woman and brought her, seems like woman's pronouns are her, at least one of them, her, unto the man. And Adam said, I mean, the world thinks they're so smart, but they're stupid. They're willingly ignorant. Some of them are deceived, but most of them are willingly ignorant. This is something anyone who can read can understand. Adam, male, Man, alone. God looks at Adam. That's not good. We want someone to complete him. Go to sleep. Brings a woman, not another man. A woman. And the Bible says her pronoun is her. I can't even believe we have to preach stuff like this. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, so he woke up and he saw her and he said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And the first word out of his mouth when he saw her was, whoa, man. And so she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother? Wait a minute, father and mother? Why can't he leave his father and father or his mother and mother? Because that's not what God intended. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto another man. No, that's not what the Bible says. Cleave unto his wife, who's a woman, whose pronouns are she and her. And they shall be one flesh. 
And they were both naked. Just saying the word, seriously, saying the word naked in public is embarrassing to me. Just saying the word, let alone even thinking of myself publicly naked. It's just, it's just one of the things about the cross. Is, as Jesus was on the cross, he was there naked in front of his mother and all. And yet these two, male and female, man and woman, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, were naked. The man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Not ashamed. The Bible says a lot about nakedness and, and how much of a sin that is. And yet here, first mention of the word naked, they were not ashamed. Because they were doing it God's way. Because it was a man and a woman. And they were married. So, again, verse 27 of chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So when Marsha Blackburn asked Katanji Brown Jackson to define woman, and she said she can't, and one of the reasons why she couldn't is because, quote, I'm not a biologist, that is willingly ignorant. She knows what a woman is. She knows what a female is. And yet, potentially, she's going to sit on the largest, highest, excuse me, highest court in our land, making decisions about our children and our grandchildren and your grandchildren. So what are we supposed to do? I mean, do we just ignore it and come to church and just praise and worship God and, and just hold on till Jesus comes or we die or what are we supposed to do? What is our responsibility in a wicked, wayward, waxing worse and worse world? What are we supposed to do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Grab your Bibles, turn to Romans. The first three quarters of this, which will go really fast, is review for you guys who've been here for a while. I will not beat this dead horse, but I do want to do the groundwork for those who are watching online and those who have not heard this before at least from me. So let's just take the first 15 verses of Romans chapter 1 as a review, again, for those who have heard the message before. My emphasis this morning is on the last portion of Romans 1. But in a world where not only... I mean, when I grew up, people who saw themselves as queer saw themselves as queer and stayed in, if you will, the closet. They were not public about it. In fact, growing up, the word gay was not at all bad. In fact, it's in our Christmas songs. It's in some of our handles, uh, hymn songs. Because the word gay simply means happy or blessed even, depending on how you use it. But the devil likes to take godly things and make them corrupt. For example... Um, I just had one I was going to use besides gay. I was going to use that one, but I don't. The rainbow. There we go. And if you do a study on it and the colors of it, and you can really get lost in all of this. I don't recommend it, actually. Just study your Bible. But what does the rainbow mean to a believer? A promise. In fact, the Bible calls it a bow. Bow in the sky. A promise. What were the events? Let's just talk a little bit. What were the events that brought about that bow, that rainbow in the sky? We said Noah. So what about Noah? Okay, before the flood. Nobody likes to start on chapter three. So what's going on? Wicked land, California or wicked land, right? What made the land so wicked? Now, we can say a bunch of sins, but try to think on this one. What made the land so wicked? What's probably one of the, if not the worst thing, one of the worst things you can do as a person that would make you so wicked in the nostrils of God? Forsaking God, I like it. Let's, let's dig that a little bit more. 
denying him, denying his power. That's right. That's where I'm at. But let's keep going a little bit more. I like it. But keep thinking. Say again, thinking you're God. So putting yourself on, on the throne there. Pride. Pride. These are the things that are going on in Noah's day. What else? Stay, stay there, but what, just keep saying that. Unpackage that a little bit more. Yeah, so you may not say, well, I'm not God, but, but this is. Or my job is, or whatever. Good, making other gods. False gods. God was completely out. I was like, no, it was there. No, God. God was completely left out. In fact, I think the Bible says, maybe not in that passage, but he says he was not in all of their thoughts. Like he wasn't even in their thoughts. I mean, they woke up, spent their day, went to bed, and didn't even consider God. Just, wow, can you imagine the God of the universe sitting on his throne, looking at the whole world, and there's only one family that even acknowledges your existence? Wow. Uh, Alex, what did you say? Cursing him. So there's some families that did acknowledge. I don't care that he's any he cursed God. Wow. So that's a little bit of the scene when God came to Noah and said, Noah, I want you to build an ark. But when you build that ark, I want you to invite the world. I want you to invite everyone in. So he's a preacher of righteousness and he's got a day job. And his family's helping him. And how many years, roughly? 120. It's not taking us 120 to do our carpet and our flooring. Praise the Lord. Feels like it. 120 years. How many people, males and females, got into the ark? Eight. Eight. Was the world worse then in your opinion or now how many would say then the world was worse then in noah's day than it is now no don't be afraid he's like hmm. it depends <laughs> how many would say it's worse then worse then how many say worse now both of my hands are up on now only reason i say now is because we've been given so much i mean the holy spirit indwells me and you if you believe and you're saved and right now we can open this door and go outside and it may take us a thousand people but somebody would get saved today today if we all just go out and we're like we're not going to stop until someone somebody would get saved today noah did that and i said well that means his world is worse there is so, to whom much is given, much, it's just my opinion, by the way. It's okay if I'm wrong. It's totally fine. But to whom much is given, much shall be required. We've been given much, much more. They couldn't go to First Baptist Church and Second Baptist Church and Third Baptist Church and this Baptist Church. They couldn't do it. They had Noah. And if they didn't live in his zip code and they didn't shop at his Walmart, we've been given much. Now, whether I'm right or wrong, doesn't matter. That, that's, that's not even pertinent to the message. The idea is the world was horrible. So what is our responsibility in our day and age when even to the point of the Supreme Court where they would say, I don't know, you know, when they're born, let's just call it an it and let them pick their pronouns. And what are we doing? What are we doing as believers? And so I believe in Paul's day, things were kind of bad too. I think they were very bad. In fact, Saul, the same guy before he was Paul, was going house to house, soul winning, right? Oh, he's finding people of the way, and he's taking them and hauling men and women, women and children to prison, killing the men. I mean, he was there when Stephen was martyred. I, the first of the first seven deacons, the first named deacon. Any deacons this morning want to be a, martyred? He was there, consenting unto his death. Days were bad then. And yet Paul, after he got saved, went around the world preaching the gospel. 
Well, one place he hadn't been quite yet, but he really wanted to go was Rome. He really wanted to go. And so we're going to fly through this because this isn't the message, but I just want to set the background. In verses 1 through 7, if you're taking notes, we see Paul's greeting. This is something I have shared with you before, but let's just do it again. Paul's greeting, verses 1 through 7. I'm not going to expound on it. This is just the way he opened up his letter. Verse 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the very first seven verses, he basically says hi. I mean, he spends a lot more. We can unpackage it, which we're not going to. I mean, we can see Paul's calling, Paul's Christ, and Paul's commission. It's all there, but we're not going to do that. He says hi. In verses 8 through 15, he goes from his greeting to Paul's gratitude. So before he gets into the letter, he says, hi, and then he says, I'm thankful for you. And we see this in verses 8 through 15. Verse 8, first, so now he's into the body of the letter. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. He just said, I really, really want to come. I intend to come. I hope to have a prosperous journey. I want to come to you. Verse 11. Why? For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that ye are to the end ye may be established. Verse 12. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as other, among other Gentiles. Verse 14, I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So he says, in the first uh, seven, eight verses, seven verses, he says, hi. Dear believers at Rome, dear church at Rome, greetings. Then he says, first of all, let me get this out of the way. I thank God for you. I'm praying for you. I long to be with you. I want to be there because I've got some things I'd love to teach you, some spiritual gifts I'd like to impart to you. But verse number 13, I don't want you ignorant. I don't want you to think Paul is so busy, he doesn't even want to come see us. No, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you. I actually had it on my calendar. My agenda was to come to you. I purposed to come to you, but was let hitherto. Can somebody tell me of a place that Paul wanted to go and God said, God, the Holy Spirit said no. Paul wanted to preach the gospel and the Holy Spirit said no. Asia. He's, he's traveling and he goes, oh, we're going to Asia. There is a need for the gospel in Asia. And the Holy Spirit said, no. Where did he end up? Do you remember? Macedonia. He had the Macedonian call. She's like, I think. <laughs> and so my point is, Paul is saying again, I want to be there, believers at Rome. But I was led here by the Holy Spirit. And we're going to end with that. Let's keep going. So we get past Paul's greeting. Paul's gratitude, and here's the emphasis of today. I just want you to understand that God is sitting on his throne, and he's not surprised 
that female Miss Katanji Brown Jackson refused to answer a simple question of what is a woman. God wasn't on his throne. Th- she doesn't know. I-, I guess I should have equipped everyone with a biology degree. God's not sitting on his throne worried. But he has a responsibility and a job for us to do. In the midst of all this, just like Noah. So here's a description of our world. I call this Paul's gospel. Paul's greeting. Paul's gratitude. In his gratitude, he congratulated them. He said he was consecrated to them. and He was concerned about them. But Paul's gospel. I have four thoughts under Paul's gospel. Paul's greeting, Paul's gratitude, Paul's gospel. Letter A, Paul's gospel, here it is. Paul's confidence, verse 16 and 17. Before he begins to describe the world, he talks about his confidence, Paul's confidence, in verse 16 and 17. He jumps in and says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm not ashamed today to say that I believe there's only two genders, male and female, as written in the very word of God. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm also not ashamed to say, and he's saying the gospel, he's saying I'm not ashamed to say that I believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And in that day, that was a big deal. And our day it is as well. But he left a group of people who believe but just not on Jesus. They believed in the resurrection, the Pharisee, that's why they were fair, you see. They believed in the resurrection, just not Jesus. Not, not, it wasn't him. We're looking for someone to rule and reign, not die. No, 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 that's not him. And so he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. Everyone that believeth, red, brown, yellow, black, and white, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul starts off this section, what I call Paul's gospel, and he says, I'm not ashamed. So let's continue past Paul's confidence to Paul's contrast. Paul's contrast as found in verses 18 and 19. Paul's contrast. You've got his confidence in verse 16 and 17, but now his contrast in verse 18 and 19. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. What is that last word? Who hold the truth in what? In verse 18, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Are you telling me that someone who is up for the Supreme Court doesn't know the true definition of a woman? She knows the truth. She, being a woman, knows the truth. But she's holding the truth in unrighteousness. Keep reading. Because that which may be known of God is manifest or manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. He's showing the contrast. They know the truth, but they're holding the truth in unrighteousness. God did not have in his plan to keep a secret from every single baby that was born. To one day, they're going to find out if they are a he, her, them, him, it, all these other. No, it's not a secret. It's not a game to God. And yet Paul is saying, I am confident. I am not ashamed of the gospel, but they know the truth and they're denying it. They're holding it in unrighteousness. And he shows a contrast there. Look again at verse 18. Because that which may be known of God is manifest. It's made known. It's revealed in them. They know the truth. They're liars. They're acting like their father, the devil, who is the father of lies. They know the truth. For God has showed it unto them. Well, maybe if somebody explains, no, God already did Quickly, the third letter C here under Paul's gospel. You have Paul's confidence. I'm not ashamed. Paul's contrast. They are. 
<laughs> they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 20 through 25, we see Paul's conviction. Paul's conviction. Paul's confidence, Paul's contrast. Thirdly, Paul's conviction. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. And, and I, I'm going to take this commercial because it popped in my head. I, as a father, I cannot imagine Chanel being my oldest child working so hard. I mean, we're talking about NCAA Division I. The amount of untold hours that went into these female swimmers to compete to be the best. I don't know how any parent sat there and just didn't become unhinged and unglued. I'm not accusing them that they should have done that. I just know me. And some things are worth going to jail over. And I'm just thinking to myself, what kind of parent would I be if my male son came to me and said, I'm going to swim against women. Why are you swimming against women? Well, I'm a woman now. Where are we at? As individuals who know the truth, but we hold it in unrighteousness. And then Paul continues and he says this in verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without, what is that last word? So that they are without, that's what Miss Tony said. They just refuse to acknowledge God in their daily lives. Going back to Noah's day. They literally just refused to acknowledge God. God has made himself very visible. This reminds me of my last Sunday school class last week. And we were talking about, is there a God? How do we prove that there's a God? We've never seen God. We've never seen the Holy Spirit. So how do we know that something exists if we've never seen it? And I was teaching them the word evidence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence. And so I said, uh, I think it was to Selah. I said, Selah, I want you to get up. We're outside having Sunday school. Pray that Victor gets out of here. We've got to start using the rest of this building. But we were outside using Sunday, having Sunday school. And I said, Selah, get up. Go get me some wind. And she got up and she was like, what? I said, just go get some wind and bring it here. It's the next point in our lesson. I need some wind. And she goes, Dad. <laughs> and she was basically, I can't go get the wind. And so then I looked at Sadie and I said, I think it was Sadie next. I said, Sadie, she can't get me the wind. Have you ever seen the wind? And she's like, no. I said, has anyone seen the wind? They said, no. I said, I've never seen the wind. But do we have any evidence to prove that there is a such thing called wind? And so we looked up at the palm trees that are over here and we saw them moving. I said, now here's what's crazy, is we see the palm trees moving. We see the evidence, the effects of the wind. But we're sitting at this table outside, just a few yards away from the palm tree, and we didn't feel the wind. So because I don't feel the wind, I don't care about the evidence, I don't believe the wind exists. That's the logic of men who deny the fact that God is real. They complete, it's very clear. Look again at verse 20. For the invisible things of, I love the word of God. I love the King James Bible. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The invisible things of him are clearly seen. What? How? Keep reading. Being understood. So first the invisible things are clearly seen. Now they're understood. By the things that are made, evidence, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's literally no excuse for anyone in the world to say there's more than two genders. There's no excuse. Yeah, but no. Facts, faith, feelings. 
When we put feelings first, well, we say, I feel like a woman today, and I feel like a giraffe today, and I feel, yeah. But when we live by the word of God, we're without excuse. Whether we live by it or not, we're without excuse. And Paul is sharing his conviction. He's already said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So let me tell you what I think about all these people. Verse 21. Because that when they knew God. I just wonder if we went back to the five-year-old and six-year-old Katanji Brown Jackson. I just wonder where she was going on Sunday. I tried to find it. But I... Five, six-year-olds, a long time ago for her. I just wonder where she was going at five and six years old. You look at some of the most famous singers throughout just your lifetime. A lot of them, when they were five and six-year-old, were in church. I'm going to say church. Some of them were in church and some of them were in a religious organization. But regardless... They knew that there was a God. I mean, just, you can name, I I don't want to name any, I got like 97 in my head right now. But the one you're thinking, probably was in church when they were five and six years old. At least the ones that were born in this country. There was a time in their life where they, even as a young person, they were thinking, even as a teenager, there's more life than this. God, if you're real, they had those moments. In verse 21, it says, because that when they knew God, how could they know God if he's invisible? God's already answered that question. There's evidence. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were what? Thankful. That's why we chose thankful songs this morning. Last night was another one of those ugh nights for me. Just, just, ugh. So I even went to the gym way too late. 24-hour fitness is open 24 hours again. And so I went there, and I walked 10,000 steps. Just, Just frustrated. And it was rather boring. But I just, I just worked this energy out just, ugh. And I knew what I was preaching today, and I knew what I was going through personally, and I knew what my house looks like, and I know what's going on with the church, and I know... And I'm just like, oh. But one thing I knew is that a lot of it would go away just coming to church. I didn't know I wasn't going to teach this morning. That wasn't intentional. That was because we got on the freeway, and then I thought we don't have the cake. And then we found out we didn't have part of the dinner. And we got off the freeway, and we went back home, and we came back here. And God does all things. Well, I don't. But I got to sit in the back which I never do. I get to listen to Brother Reggie, which I never get to do live. And I sat there and the Lord says, do you seriously think what you're doing is not important? I always envision God as, as, what do you call it? I always forget the name. The person that leads the orchestra. Conductor. I always think of train when I think of conductor. He's a conductor too, I guess. But I can see God as he's leading the orchestra And sometimes I feel like this is my instrument. (laughs) Except for I don't get to play the whole time. It's like counting, I'm counting. (sighs) Measure 78. (laughs) And then he looks at me. That's it just once. Oh, (laughs) But in the big scheme of his plan, you got to have it. You, You can't walk off the track. You may want to be first fiddle, first violin. You may want to do, but this is the instrument that God, and and I often, I'm just being transparent, telling you, I feel sometimes this is seriously my instrument. God, all that you've given me, why is this my instrument? What am I doing? And what I'm saying to God is I'm being, notice the word, verse 21. Neither were thankful. I'm headed down a path when I'm not being thankful. I'm headed down the path of this idiot lady named Jackson. Somewhere in her past, she began to be unthankful and began to put herself on the throne. 
getting ready to sit on the highest court in our country and won't define, won't define what a woman is. So it's easy to beat her up, but what are we supposed to do as believers? Just beat up the world? No. We have a responsibility, and I'm trying to get to that, but the reality is I'm thinking, I look at my instrument and I go, I'm not thankful. It says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, I can say in my life, I know God. They glorified him not as God, treated him like a genie. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. So now we look at God. We're not glorifying God. We're not thankful for our instrument. And what do we do? It's a, it's a, I was going to say a progression. It's a digression, digression, but became vain in their imagination. So now, well, if I, I should just do this. And we start thinking things we have no business thinking. And it started over here. I don't want to be a boy. Lord, why did you make me a boy? And we're not thankful that, well, you created me a boy. I bring up the story a lot of the missionary with the brown eyes who wanted blue eyes. What's her name? It's right there. Oh, what's her name? Missionary to India? Amy Carmichael. And uh, I think you made me read that book, actually. Um, <laughs> made me read it. <laughs> it was good, was it? I think so. And, um, but I just, I remember her complaining to herself, to her friends. She wanted blue eyes. And, uh, had, no, yeah, wanted blue eyes. She had brown eyes, blue eyes. And uh, fast forwarding to her life, she wouldn't have been able to do what she did in India and, and orphanages and all those things if she had blue eyes. I believe she had to put makeup on and do different things to blend in, but she didn't have to do anything to her eyes. And this is before contacts and all that cool stuff. So the reality is she was unthankful, but eventually she got over it. And she was thankful. And by the end of it, she realized, oh, God, from day one, God, you had a plan for me. You had a plan for me. Like literally when I was born, a female with this, these color eyes, you knew. It's like you're the author and finisher. It's like you actually are in tomorrow. It's like you're sovereign or something. But what happens is if we get the beginning of Amy Carmichael and we just get mad and we wish we had blue eyes and we never repent of that unthankfulness, we continue down this negative path, becoming vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Say, so how could a man do that with another man? How could a woman do that with another one? How do they do it? Here's the, the digression of it. Is that even a word? Here's, here's going downhill. Here's the downhill of it. Here's the digression. Here, here it is. It started with just going... I don't like me. I know there's a God and you created me this way. Therefore, I don't like you is what I'm saying. And I'm unthankful. And I'm unthankful. And I'm unthankful. And I just can't believe I'm this way. And I just don't want to be this way. I just always wanted to be a girl. I just always, and you just imagination is getting vain. And now your heart is getting dark. And God never moved. The gospel never changed. The church didn't get mean. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise. Well, I know what I'll do. This is my plan. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I mean, as believers, you ought to look at them and go, what, what are they even thinking? What bothers me more than what are they thinking is how could my brother, my sister, my friend, and I don't mean brother blood, I'm talking about just those around me, people I rub shoulders with, how can they support that? So not only what are they thinking, but what are you thinking? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. 
Might be a good passage for your Sunday school class next week, guys. Wherefore, God also gave them up. Those are sad words. They gave up on God. Wherefore, God also gave them up. He didn't give up on them, but he gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies. You know how miserable they are? I mean, I've talked to several homosexuals, sodomites, whatever you want to call it. I mean, several. We've, we had one in our church who, who re repented of that and, and, and began the process of trying to, <laughs> wow. And what a horrible process that was. I mean, he got saved and he's going on for the Lord. And, but man, all of the baggage and trying to unpackage that and, and he, he repented of it. But he, just all the things. But he talked about his testimony. One of the services we gave him, it was like an hour and 15 minute message. He, he just preached his testimony. And he talked about every night for the most part, if he weren't high or drunk, he was miserable. Miserable. Just every night he was miserable. And here the Bible says they changed the glory of God, glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like two corruptible men and a birds and a four-footed beast and creeping things wherefore God also gave them to Clean, gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So he gives his conviction and he says they're wrong. There's no excuse for them. I don't know how many quote-unquote believers, professors, I can call them that, professors, professing Christians, professing believers, who make excuse for this, this stuff that's going on in our world. I'm thinking, how? How do you make excuse for that? Paul says, no, it is my conviction that they're wrong. That they've changed a holy, holy, holy God to an incorruptible thing and made their God an idol. One of you brought that up. An idol. We go from Paul's conviction to Paul's condemning. Now, I only have one point this morning, and I'm almost there. There's really one purpose of this whole message, why I feel the Lord put it on my heart Friday and, and confirmed it Saturday. But we had Paul's confidence, Paul's contrast, Paul's conviction. Now, Paul's condemning. <clears throat> Verse 26 through 32. So verse 25 says, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Why coming on fire season in California? Why is fire season so bad? Why do we have a season called fire season? You know why? It's because we refuse to do what is scientifically wise and we just let it grow. Because we are now worshiping the creation and we're not worshiping the creator god has given us wise men who know if we do this this and that and i'm, I'm trying not to completely chase this rabbit but we're approaching fire season and people are going to die and homes are going to burn and we're going to make a big stink of it and we're going to get more money to california and do nothing about it uh hmm, love of money is root of all evil the love of money is the root of all evil but why do we have a fire season here it's because there's people who are literally worshiping why do we have a housing shortage? I'm not talking about homeless. I'm talking about why we can't buy a home right now. I mean, you can make $80,000 in California and can't buy a home. How's that possible? It's because we have environmentalists who have put so much pressure on our Sacramento government that they won't even allow homes to be built. I mean, there's construction that, that just is sitting waiting. 8, 10, 15,000 homes could go up, but we won't do it because the environment and, and we might mess up this cockroach. And we're worshiping the creature more than the creation. There's something wrong. And so here we see Paul's condemning. Because in verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie. Verse 26, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affection. If that's what you want, if you don't want to come into the ark, if that's what you want, 
God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It is against nature for a woman to be with a woman. It is against nature for a man to be with a man. And they worship nature, supposedly. And God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the man, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Say, why does a boy like another boy? Well, it goes back to not worshiping God when they knew that there was a God and not being thankful for who God created them to be. Unthankfulness is a big deal, and I'm avoiding the other passages in the New Testament where they're listing the sins, and unthankfulness is in there. Proverbs. I smell the food, so I'm trying to hurry. Unthankfulness is a big deal. Verse 27, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Can you imagine sinning knowing there's a God? That's easy for us to imagine because when we sin we know we're grieving the Holy Spirit. But can you imagine continually grieving the Holy Spirit to the point where the Holy Spirit, where God the Holy Spirit gives you up? Not gives up on you. Gives you up. Let you go. That's what you want. That vile affection. And he lets you go. Yet you're still thinking, I know there's a God. And there's still this inner, oh, I know there's a God. And even verse 28, as they did not like to retain, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind. You don't even want to struggle with thinking about me anymore? Then here, a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient. Paul knew how to speak even in front of children. To do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness. All of it. Fornication wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. How are you full of envy if you're living your best life, life now? <laughs> Why would you want something else? If you've made yourself God and you're doing everything you lustfully want to do, why are you still envy? Because you know it's not right. It's not satisfying. Full of envy. Murder. So since they don't like the fact that you actually have the joy of the Lord, now they're envying you and envy, hatred, leads to murder. Debate. They love to argue with you and call you all kind of mean things that aren't even true. Deceitful or deceit. Malignity. Whispers. Backbiters. Haters. Of God. In verse 21, it says, because that when they knew God. Verse 30, it says, now they're haters of God. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. So, all the sin that was in Noah's day, we're way past Noah's day here in, in Romans. We're way past Noah's day. Now they're inventing new sin. Inventing inventors of evil things. Disobedient to parents. How'd that get in the list? It's a big deal. Without understanding. Ignorant. Covenant breakers. Without natural affection. I mean, would you not call abortion? I mean, those who just laugh about it? I, I still have in my mind New York when they signed that 
uh, up to so many, I think 12 hours, don't, don't quote me, but when they signed that last bill before Cuomo got the boot, which he sure deserved, and the person that re replaced him is his twin brother. Um, when they signed that bill, and they were cheering and clapping, now we can kill babies 12 hours after they're born. I mean, they're, doesn't that fit with without natural affection? I mean, complete strangers. I'm, I could walk in a mall. I could be in a, a place all by myself pushing a stroller with one of my children and complete strangers. Oh, let me see him. Let me see her. That's natural. There's two of them. You had twins? Wow, that's natural. It is unnatural to murder and rejoice at the thought of murdering babies. Without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Here's the condemning, who knowing the judgment of God. Supposedly, Joe Biden's a Catholic. I guess he's a good one. But somewhere in his life, he was taught there's a heaven and hell. Somewhere, even as a Catholic, he knew there's a place he didn't want to go. What changed? What changed? Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which Commit such things are worthy of death. So they know. They know there's a God. They're without excuse. They know you shouldn't kill babies. They know they shouldn't let a male compete against a female in wrestling. They know that. They know what they're doing. But God gave them up. And they know some of these things that they are approving of are worthy of death. They know that. But they do the same and have pleasure in them that do them. Support others. So what a great encouraging Sunday morning message. But to me the state of our union is this. That really doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is what are you doing? What am I doing? Now my kids know the answer to this because we've gone over this many, many times. But why didn't Paul go to Rome? We all know this answer because we read it. Because what? The Holy Spirit. Okay? But why didn't didn't the Holy Spirit let Paul go to Rome? Well, it's here in our text, and I know you know this answer, but this is your job as well in the midst of all of this. The Bible says in verse 14 of chapter 1, and we're done. I am debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise. So as, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Church, in the midst of all of the mess that we're in, just remember Philip. Big revival happening at church. And the Holy Spirit tapped Philip on the shoulder and he says, leave the revival. Yes, sir. He's going out in the desert. Where are we going? <laughs> what are we doing here? Why did I leave the revival? Philip's out there. Sees a chariot. Holy Spirit, join yourself to that chariot. 
runs, catches the chariot. You know what you're reading? How can I? Except somebody show me. I'll show you. Well, come on. What are you reading? I'm reading over here. Isaiah. Or... Is Isaiah talking about himself or some other man or prophet? Oh, great question. And the Bible says that Philip began to preach Jesus. He then sees water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? You know the story. But the reality is this. Philip stayed busy following his leader. And he stayed on course. And in the midst of all that's going on, I'm telling you, this week has not been great. But I have to stay on course. And the number one reason I even bring this up today is because of our young people. Because I have no idea. I heard it growing up. It's going to be harder for you growing up. And I, I think maybe they were right. As I'm an adult now. I don't know if I should do that. I am an adult. As I'm an adult now. I think it is a little bit harder for me than it was. Especially when I get around older preacher. When I get around older preacher, I'm talking 60, 70, some 80. How many of you running over there at Solid Rock? And then I tell them, enough. <laughs> and then they walk away because I don't want to tell them the answer. Because then they tell me, I remember when we wanted to start it. This is a true testimony. We wanted to start a church in California. I drove until I ran out of gas. That's how I knew it was the right city. And the first Sunday we had 40, and the next Sunday we had 100. And, and we grew a building, and da, da, da. And I'm thinking, thanks. Appreciate that. That's really encouraging. Because it wasn't for me. Maybe it was for someone else. This isn't easier. And I don't. I don't have a clue what it's going to be like when you're in your 40s and in your 50s if God tarries is coming. I have no idea. But it would be foolish of me to not at least tell you this world is disgusting. And if you're attracted to it at all, I mean, if you're attracted to that, then you need to go back at being thankful. Because I can't imagine a herald being asked the question, what is a woman? And being ashamed to answer what the Bible says a woman is. Andy, what's a woman? Oh, let me show you. Proverbs 31. This is what a woman told her son. And I just want to give you an example. Yeah. Don't be ashamed. There's kids your age right now trying to figure out, boys, how to be a girl. There's videos out there to teach them how to change what they look like without surgery. There's people in Sacramento who are trying to figure out how to change the laws so that six-year-olds can begin to take pills without their parents' permission to destroy their bodies. That's Satan's MO. When God created man, he created him out of what? Dirt. Brother Scheibach taught us that when Satan, when Lucifer was in heaven, he said, I will be like the Most High God. And the Most High God says, nope. <laughs> Kicked him out. And then he looked at dirt, and he gave dirt his image. And when Satan looks at you, dirt, that does not make him happy. Because he wanted to be like the Most High God. And we actually are sealed with God the Holy Spirit. I don't know, I have no idea about your future, no idea. But I don't see how you can be prepared if we don't talk about these things. Sammy, God created you for a purpose. As a female young lady, on purpose. The eye color, which I'm jealous of. All of you have hair in here, I'm jealous of that. God created you that way. Skin tone. I'll end with this. It was uh, Father's Day. I guess 2020. I think we were still locked down. And AC gets one of the girls' phones and sends me a Happy Father's Day text. Now this is June 2020, right? Father's Day, June. And June 2020, man, the world's all messed up and all of a sudden now it matters what color you are, which all of my life, I didn't even know I was black until I left California. 
That's how much I cared about what color I was. And then I got to Indiana, and it still mattered to some people over there. And, um, but it's Father's Day. My phone buzzes. I look at it, and AC sent me a text that said, thanks for making half of my life matter. Now, he's being silly, but that's about as dumb as things like Black Lives Matter. What are we talking about? For God so loved the world. I'm not ashamed. I want to be like Jesus, and to Jesus, all lives matter. There's not a subject matter that's under attack by Satan that this book doesn't bring me comfort to know that I'm right. I refuse to say that one life is more important than the other. Before we got married, I talked to Sherry. If we're able to have children, and if the doctor says he has to abort the baby to save your life, what would you say? I asked her that before we were married. Because if she would have said, well, I don't want to die, then you're not the one. I'm not making that decision. That's God's call. That was before we got married. That's not my call. Well, it's based on film. Well, some abortions, if we don't talk about all these things, they're ready to talk to our children about it and our grandchildren and our nieces, and our nephews. God created you the way he did on purpose. And if you say, well, that's why I'm a liar. No, 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 that's you. We submit, we repent, we confess, we forsake. We empty ourselves, we fill with the Holy Spirit to do exactly what God called us to do. I'm extremely burdened, mainly because a lot of these kids are mine in this church. But I'm burdened for our church. And I'm also believing we're too quiet. We're too quiet at work. I'm too quiet on the basketball court. Heard it yesterday again. God's name in vain didn't say anything. Now, I wasn't on the court playing, but I should have said something. That's been bothering me a lot because every time I go to the court, they're using God's name in vain. I'm sure the same at work. Why would I not say, he loves me? Am I not thankful enough to stand up for him? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the message. I know it wasn't necessarily under our theme, one another, but I can't help but to think about one another in the midst of this world that I'm not a biologist. I'm qualified to sit on the Supreme Court, but I'm not qualified to answer the question, what is a woman? Lord, the devil is doing a good job of destroying this world. And yet, I believe our churches aren't doing a good job of preparing our young people, our teenagers, even our children. Lord, we need to do better. And so our responsibility is that of Paul's, of Noah's, Abraham, all these men of God, to preach the Word. I would love to go to a church where there's a choir and there's an actual nursery and where the bills are actually paid. And I'd love that. I'd love to go to a church that's in walking distance of my house. There's like three. But I'm debtor. I'm debtor. And so really what I need to love is you and be thankful to play my instrument as often as you would have me play it. Like Brother Reggie said in Sunday school, to max out on my points as part of the team. Thank you for being the great conductor of all of this. You do all.